I lost Jason. Jason's gone. <laughs> and I've replaced him with my dad. You're 74 now, Dad? Yeah, 74. He's, he's, he's knee deep. No, he's waist deep in the grave. <laughs> Thank you very but much. But you're, he's still going strong. Listen, this is our first Bible study that we get to do on the other side of the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision. So it's been awesome. And I wanted to bring dad on and I first wanted to honor my dad. You know, I, I watched the Top Gun movie. Thank God for the mm. Top Gun movie. It wasn't all the movie. woke nonsense, go woke, go broke, all that garbage. And I remember the, the opening scene, and I don't want to say too much for those who haven't seen it, but when Tom Cruise was faced, when Maverick was faced with a decision, he, was, he said, Maverick, they, they said to him, you know what happens if you go through with this? And he pauses, Mav, and he looks out the window and he says, I know what happens to everyone else if I don't. Mm. That is something that is, that is, that is my dad to a T. Mm. I remember watching dad get arrested. I remember watching him get beat up. Was it Ruth Street? Ruth yeah. Street Clinic? Ruth Street Clinic, yeah. The police, this was back Dallas. in the, back in the late eighties, early nineties, and they would brutalize him. Now I'm 13, 14, 15 years old. And this was the birth of the mega church movement. And so I'm watching the birth of the mega church and these preachers getting kind of famous and big churches. And then I'm watching my dad on a Saturday morning with 40 police officers around him, some on mounted horse. And I'm watching my dad, literally, they're just beating the snot out of him. They pushed you down an entire flight of stairs while he was cuffed. I watched the whole thing. So in me and Jason's heart, I'm like, I'm watching two worlds here. Like I'm going to... To see my friends are going to church on a Sunday morning singing, going into the enemy's camp, going to take back what he stole from me, right? And then I'm, I'm watching my dad get beat up, and I'm watching Sunday school teachers have their arms broken. I watch this stuff in my eyes. And I love the William Wallace uh, line when he tells Robert the Bruce, he says, men don't follow titles, men follow courage. Mm -hmm. And so... I just, I, you know, dad's never had a mega church. We never had more than a hundred people. He said he was the Dr. Kevorkian of church growth. <laughs> How horrible is that? But that's, you don't grow a big church when you talk about the other side of Jesus, the dread champion, the warrior, the one who stands and resists state, Satan, who's willing to lay down his life. We love that Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. We love all that. And we love all the blessed life. But we don't like talking about the fact that there is a judgment to come, that the devil is real, that spiritual battles manifest themselves in the earth today. And so that's where I grew up. You know, it's funny, I see Scott out here, I see Deli out here. It reminds me of a story when dad calls me and Jason 15 years ago. I'll never forget it. He goes, hey, I need you and four of your buddies, you two and four of your buddies to come. So my, Jason and I called Deli, and we call Scott, we call David Dry. I said, well, what are we doing? He goes, just meet me at Chick-fil-A out at uh, 49 and Concord Mills Boulevard. And I'm like, okay. So we show up and dad says, okay, I need the four of you to stand on the sidewalk. Don't go into Chick-fil-A. We're going to stand on the sidewalk. And then I'm going to turn on the microphone and I'm going to start preaching to the cars that are passing by Concord Mills. And I said, well, why are you doing this? He goes, well, the city of Concord just passed an ordinance that you cannot preach beyond a certain decibel level. You, you can't have more than two people, right? Right, right. Yeah. You can't have more than two people when you're preaching. Or otherwise, it's a parade. And if you don't have a permit, you'll be arrested. And I was like, are you? So why are we doing this? He goes, well, I needed five of you so that we could consider it a parade. And then I'm going to call the police on us. <laughs> I was like, what? Literally, I kid you not. You remember Deli? You remember Scott? We're standing there, all of us, and Dad's like on the phone, you know, whatever you said to whoever. Next thing you know, you hear a siren in the distance. And the cops show up. And Dad goes, now they're going to warn you. And after they warn you, you can just walk away. And I'm not going to walk away. Come on. And I, love, and I remember asking, I won't give you the rest of the story, buy Living Among Lions and read the whole story. But I remember asking Dad, I said, Dad, now why are you doing this? He goes, I'm doing it so you don't have to. Isn't that awesome? I mean, d d you're going to feel a little awkward when I start saying some of these things, but that's what real leaders do. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life. In America, we're not necessarily dying, but we are laying down our lives, which is our 
our, or maybe our platform or maybe our business or maybe the desire to become a big preacher or whatever. I mean, dad is a pastor through and through. He is a pastor 100%. He would have loved to shepherd a church. He would have loved to have done that. But that wasn't in the cards for him because there was a wall broken down. And dad saw the breach in the wall and dad decided to step in. I want to give a quick overview and then dad, we, you and I are going to walk through the next okay. 50 minutes or so. We're going to walk through your story. But I want to give everybody a quick overview very quickly. Dad started out as a pro-abortion pastor right out of seminary. That ought to tell you something. He, he wasn't, he just was just pro, that's what the, that's what he learned. Until something happened in Atlanta. And then after Atlanta, dad comes back. Now he's a pro-life pastor. Then he loses his church. He's given the choice. Are you going to be a pastor or a pro-life activist? And dad's like, wait, hold on a second. As I read this, I don't see the dichotomy. And in the church at the time, as Jason and I are now watching this, Dad loses his church. We saw every, we watched it completely fall apart. I remember showing up, remember Garland Free Methods, we showed up and the doors were, the chain, <laughs> they were literally chained up. And I remember just thinking, okay, wow, this is, this is, pretty, this is pretty crazy. And Dad would speak to Jason and me and, and to the rest of the family. There is no sacred secular divide. I cannot be a pastor when the unborn are being slaughtered. This is what God calls us to do. Then 1991, Wichita, mm. a massive yeah, move great. of God, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of believers in 91. And that was the height of the abortion movement. In 1992, Houston, mm. sisters of perpetual indulgence, oh, yeah. transgender nuns that were marching through the streets in Houston. Sister Boom Boom. Yeah. Remember her? And her sisters of and perpetual. Her or him. Yeah. I have him. no idea. It was him. But dad called it out. Dad dealt with it right out of the gate and got sent to jail. Now all of a sudden, look at what's happening in America today. 1993, you were asked to be the leader of Operation Rescue, which mm -hmm. had a ton of baggage. I mean, it was crazy. Like, chain yourself to school buses in front of abortion clinics and all this. <laughs> but they needed a big time shift. And so dad... When he stepped in the first move, no violence. We will condemn justifiable homicide. The people, because there was rumors like we should just kill abortionists if they're killing. And dad stepped right up national platform. We will not do that. Greater love has no man than this. We are Christians. We are loving. And the second biggest move was we will make this a gospel issue. This is not a political issue. And that's when dad coined conservatism is pretend salt. It acts like salt, tastes like salt, looks like salt, and it seeks the vote of salt. But it's not salt because it has nothing for which it's willing to die. And that's exactly what we're seeing in America today. Daggum Republicans. Dems are going off the cliff at 100 miles an hour. The Republicans are going off at 55. Both of them are going off, one slower than the other. I remember in 1995, Jane Roe. Hmm. I remember hmm. Norman McCorvey at our dinner table. I remember her lesbian partner, Connie, at our dinner table. I remember Dad sharing the gospel. I remember watching Connie's chin start quiver and tears start coming down. Now I'm a teenage kid. Jason's doing all kinds of sinful things. I'm trying to <laughs> disciple him as best I can. But we're watching the gospel like played out. Like dad's speaking this message about the gospel is the center. And yet we have these two people. Now I didn't have social media. We didn't get to selfie ourselves. Dad didn't go on some fundraising campaign because now all of a sudden he's got Jane Rowe at his table, which is what a lot of influencers would do today. But he was sharing the gospel. We were watching the gospel penetrate. And all it was is that's called social proof. It was just a testimony. We were watching it. 1995, New Orleans, murder mm -hmm. capital of America. Mm -hmm. Dad publicly proclaimed, if you, you and Bob Shank, Bill, uh, Bill, Shanks. Bill, Shanks, Bill Shanks, if yeah. you shut down, if we are coming as Operation Rescue, and if these seven abortion clinics in New Orleans close down, you will not have one murder in the streets. Everybody thought he was a nut. They closed down the abortion clinics for seven days? How, how many days? Oh, no. Seven days, and it was Bill Shanks that made that statement at a, a, comp, a press conference yep. that the mayor was supposed to conduct, but when he saw all of the pro-lifers out there, that he wouldn't come out. So Bill Shanks, who was there, Took said, over. I got up. He got up, and he had the whole media, and he pronounced this. What 1995. He 19. said, if you close these abortion clinics down, all the murders in the street, you will not have one murder. And look, you go back and it's exactly what happened. No, not is. one murder in New Orleans for seven straight days when those abortion clinics were closed. The mayor actually gave you the key to the city. Oh, I got that three years. Well, seven years later. 
10 years later. And then what did he do with the key? key? After you got the key, then what did he do? <laughs> what did he do? He tried to take it back. Yeah, he wanted he, it back. He wanted it back. everybody went nuts. All the people went nuts. <laughs> you gave the key to the city to this guy, and the, and the mayor's like, they said the uh, murders would stop, and it did. And it's actually news. Now, you don't see that on mainstream news. But anyway, so you don't have the key to New Orleans, so you're safe, New Orleans no, I people. I still have it. Oh, okay, well, he's got the key. <laughs> 1997, Dr. Haskell and partial birth abortion. That's when it really became hot, and yeah. Dad publicly confronted the, the partial birth abortion doctor. Now, I'm watching all of this as a kid, and I'm watching public confrontation. At this time, Jason and I, we were just now, we had left uh, high school, we were in college, and we were watching while we were at Liberty. I remember we would have super conference. And I remember some of the pastors would come in for super conference. And I just remember how like trendy and cool they were. And I remember this whole word about be relevant to culture. And I remember, I, I just, I'll never forget some of these things. You know, Dr. Falwell was always preaching about salt and light. But then in chapel, we sometimes would have some of these preachers that would come in and are like, our goal is to be relevant to society. Our goal is to be cool because God is cool. Our goal is to be winsome because God is winsome. Now, at the same time, I'm watching my dad get beat up. I'm watching my dad like his platform is just a <laughs> like this. And these other guys platform is doing this. Here's the thing. And I'm, my point in telling you is that when a true shepherd sees a wolf does not run. The only reason in John 10 that a shepherd ever runs is because he's a hireling. He cares nothing but about his image, his income, and his influence. And that's where we've been in the church. So I want to honor Dad for being a true biblical shepherd. At the turn of Roe v. Wade, as soon as it happened, Jason and I, our Facebook, blew up, and nobody wanted to know what we thought. Everybody wanted to say, thank you to your dad. Yes. Tell your dad thank hmm. you. It's awesome. All right, I'm moving on. I don't want to get choked up. Why don't you just say what happened at Liberty University? I'm going to. Dad, I'm not there yet. (laughs) For heaven's sake. 1998 was the 25th anniversary. Now, we can't run the zebra too far. We're going to make these short and sweet. But the 1998 was the 25th anniversary of Roe versus Wade. It's also the same time that uh, President Bill Clinton got caught doing what he was doing uh, in the Oval Office. And his pastor... Basically, was Phil Wagaman, the Phil United, Wagaman. what was the name? United Methodist Church. And, it was, it and, was the one that Bill and Hillary went yep. to. And he preached a sermon that it was just total, complete heresy. And Dad showed up, and when the president came out of the church, smiling with, with his Bible after he'd been exposed with Monica Lewinsky with his Bible over his head. What did you say? I don't. You, even you called him out. Well, he publicly confronted the heresy of Phil Wagaman and the president. So then in uh, 1999, Dad, you were at a Buffalo school. You guys were evangelizing and telling the kids about abortion outside of a Buffalo school in Buffalo, and it was two days before the Columbine attack. And you publicly said that bloodshed will course itself through the halls of our school systems because of the shedding of innocent blood. If we don't deal with abortion, you publicly said it. Bloodshed touches bloodshed. Hosea chapter four, verse two, that you're going to, you're going to reap what you sow. You sow it in the womb, you're going to reap it in the streets. And there's absolutely nothing you're going to be able to do to stop that lest God's hand moves and he himself stops that, which would, and the only one that can move God's hand is the church of Jesus Christ. That's us, not 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, not the Supreme Court, not Congress, but us, as we allow the light to shine and repent before God of what we've done, then God will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sin and he will heal our land. That's what we need. Two days later, Columbine, and we see this. Then two years later, so now all of a sudden, I remember picking up a book, 365 of the world's most influential people. And I'm flipping through and I see Michael Jordan, and I see Bill Gates and all this. And I flipped to like, I don't remember what page, like 87 or whatever, and it says, Flip Benham. I'm like, what on earth? That's my dad. Who, who, who taught him to do his hair like that? Well, anyway, so we're, I'm, I'm reading through and then I'm reading just through all of this. And of course, the way that the narrative shaped it to be was he's anti-abortion anti-women, it was all the anti-stuff, anti-women, anti-this, anti-that, and they would lump him into the justifiable homicide people that said you could kill an abortionist and all this other stuff. 
What year did Paul Hill shoot that abortion? Nineteen ninety four. Okay, ninety four. But you confronted him before oh, he. Yeah. yeah, Dad publicly confronted him. Sorry, I'm I'm backing up like eight nine years. Dad publicly confronted him before he shot that abortion. And says In we Chicago. do not do this. Yep. We do not do this. Well, of course, Paul Hill shoots and kills the abortionist. And who's going to get the residual bad rap for all of that? Is dad. And I started watching pastors distanced from dad. And I remember the largest churches in Dallas refused to be around dad. And the largest church, the pastor brought dad in and he said this, and I won't say his name. Almost all of them have lost influence in culture because remember, they don't follow titles. They're following courage. Dad walks in and the pastor goes, flip. For you to be my friend costs you nothing, but for me to be your friend is going to cost me everything. <laughs> and he refused. They refused to say they would associate with Flip Benham. They refused to associate. So the Benham family, Jason and I kind of grew up, and I realize as I pray, why am I always punching pastors verbally? Why am I always getting them? Because I'm ticked off. <laughs> yeah. I'm an angry elf. No, but God is working. God is working on my heart. Because God is pulling the mantle from the limp-wristed weakness, oh, mm -hmm, and He's mm -hmm. placing the mantle into a new generation yeah. of courageous leaders. And there are several in here that are going to get a chance to do a little talk in here uh, when we get done. And then 1998, uh, you confronted Bill Clinton, and another, also you confronted in 98 the Republican Party uh, and for its weakness on pro-life stance. He would say, you just simply, you plead the case of the, of the widows and the orphans to plead it. You do not plead it to win it. Amen. And that, I remember the theology of Moses, not one hoof. Not mm. one hoof like Pharaoh wanted to say, wanted to make all these compromises. And, dad, and then finally, M Moses said, not one hoof is going to be left in Egypt. We're all going. And dad would say, that's it. Not one baby, not one Down syndrome kid, not one. We are life all the way through. 19, uh, let's see, 2000, also in 2001, two days before the 9-11 attack, you were kneeling in front of the White House. Mm -hmm. And they said, please get up. You cannot do this. Mm -hmm. And they said, of 19 of you. It was 19. Dad and 19. Was it total of 19? Yeah. Well, no, there were more outside, but those of us kneeling 19. and remain kneeling were 19. Yep. So they said, this is your last and final warning. Scott was yep. there. Yep, this is your last and final warning. You get up or we will arrest you. And Dad stood to his feet and publicly said, America, this is your last and final warning. Bloodshed is going to come on this country like we've never seen before. That was two days before 9-11. Exact same thing happened two years earlier when he prophesied that about Columbine. He didn't say Columbine, but it was the, the shedding of innocent blood. We have turned our backs on God. And you spent some time in jail uh, there. Then um, I remember the FBI, I'll never forget, right at our, our house, 621 Dawn Drive in Garland, Texas. There's this, they, they put this huge light up. And I remember, it's one of those big light poles. And the light was right, right over the top of our house. And I remember thinking, Dad, what is this? He's like, I don't know, I don't have a clue. And then we, get, we had a buddy that was in the police department. And he told us, he said, hey, listen, you know why they put that light there at y'all's house? And we're like, why? He said, we got a little beat sheet or whatever they call it. The FBI has a surveillance camera in there to watch your family. It's just craziness, all this kind of stuff. I remember we would be sitting there, I'll never forget one time, mom had made these salmon patties. And I was like, ooh, salmon patties. And knock at the door, Jason and I are sitting at the table, Tracy's at the table, dad and mom, we hear a and dad gets up and looks out the window and then bolts out the back door. I'm like, what's going on? We open the doors, two FBI agents. They had come to investigate dad. I mean, just all kinds of bogus nonsense. They ended up finding him hiding behind the shed. He's like, I just didn't want to go to jail again. He spent so much time in jail when we were kids. People would come up to us and be like, I'm really sorry your dad's in jail. And Jason and I are like, thank God. He's in jail. <laughs> yeah. Mom lets us watch Mr. Belvedere. She takes us to Dairy Queen and we get blizzards. Yeah. Like, I mean, heck, we even got to watch Dukes of Hazard. We had to go to bed when Dad was at home. But when Mom was home, we got to watch Dukes of Hazard, which probably wasn't a great thing at that time in our lives. But anyway, so here we are now. Um, we, we've got all of this. And so I, I just want to roll through you know, what Jason and I caught, we, we have spoken and people will say, we want you and your brother to come speak at a leadership event. I'm like, well, you know, I, I wouldn't call myself a leader, but I will talk about the leaders that have been in my life. And we always start with dad. And we say that leadership is the ability to create an appetite in those who follow you. 
Like, what kind of appetites are you creating? And the appetite that dad created in us was an appetite for courage, an appetite to fight, an appetite to be all in 100% for Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just something he taught us. It's something we watched. And so, dad, take us back. Seminary. You get out of seminary. Mm -hmm. 1980? At 1980, graduated. 1980, off. we go to Dallas. Dallas, Texas. Garland, Texas, actually, about 20 miles northeast. Of and you were, you were pro-choice, basically. Yeah, well, we basically, because the evangelical church had really lost its way. Um, and so we had lots and lots of pastors. I mean, Baptists, United Methodists, that really didn't understand the issue at all. And therefore, we never took a sin. Now, the Catholics always had it right yep. about life begins Thank at conception. The you, they, they were stood. They were the ones that were, you know, out there in the streets marching against Roe versus Wade, but not the evangelical church. It didn't, it just didn't happen. And so when I went to seminary and, and I took um, our social science class and uh, ethics class uh, and we talked about the issue of abortion, it was sort of like, um, you know, it's, it's not the best thing, but it's probably not the worst thing. And, and so that's, that's what I learned in seminary. By the way, he was a saloon owner. Of course, we tell his testimony in Bold and Broken, but he's a saloon owner now in seminary. So he's like a blank slate. They could have really birthed some amazing pro-life pastors, but this is what was happening. So we go to Dallas, start the church, and but you're seeing stuff that's happening yeah, in the yeah. culture. So we get involved. We we just know, and, and, and I know that I'm supposed to get there. I always had a problem, and I, I'm here to, to start a church. That's what they're paying me for. They paid me $15,000, which was a lot of money back then in, 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 in 1980 and for, for me. And so we, we just had this idea that we got to build a church, but then I've also got the gospel of Christ. And I was having a real problem with starting the church and then, and then presenting the gospel. But at any rate, we did. We began. You boys were our greeters, and we'd have people come in. We'd just go to the neighborhood. We'd go visit. We'd do what you do to grow a church. And we grew a little church. We went to one little um, uh, daycare center and then to another one. And then to the, ultimately, we ended up at the YMCA in Garland until they threw us out because of all of our activities. But what we began to see is that we needed, we were to allow the theology of heaven to become biography in the street. We were to allow the word of God to become flesh. We were to go ahead and proclaim out there, wherever it was, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I, can I say one thing yeah. real quick? Okay, so today's day and age, if you want to start a church, you got to get a brand, logo, website, cool pastor, get a great social media following, hand out backpacks, talk about all the money you're giving to drill wells, and you start getting people. That is the one way we did it. It's yeah. the way that dad showed us is we're evangelizing our neighborhood. We're evangelizing on the baseball team, you know, getting grief from Garner Little League because we were praying before games and all of this other stuff. And then secondly, at the same time, this whole secular sacred divide was taking place and the mainstream media would say, you're okay to be a Christian, just keep it to yourself. Keep it inside of the pew or keep it inside of your head or inside of your home, but do not let it go out. That's what empowered Hitler. That's what empowers all of these dictators throughout history is the religious system believes that lie. But dad just had just thwarted that lie without even knowing any of that history. It was just because he was in the Word of God. So we go and we deal with um, the 7-Eleven, which was Southland Corporation. 7-Elevens were the big, big, like QT stores. They were the big deal back in, in Dallas, Texas. And of course, the main headquarters was right there in Dallas, Texas. And they were putting magazines on there, Playboy, Hustler magazine, and everything else. And so when we realized that, we, we thought, well, we'll go to our 7-Eleven and we'll say, you know, we'll say that this is bad. You need to take the kitty porn off of here. And, and, and so we went right out in the streets and did that. That was the first time I ever held a sign up. Yeah, yeah. Holding up a sign, I'm just humiliated. My yeah, head's uh, down. Oh, it was humiliating. So you get lots of middle fingers, you yeah. know. They're, they're pointing in the right direction, just using the wrong finger. And we just go and we give them heaven. <laughs> that's good. And, and that's what we did. Where'd you we get gave that? them heaven. <laughs> that's awesome. I using will be that using for that. At least 15 years. I've been saying for years been. those people are pointing in the right direction, just using the wrong finger. Okay. Sorry. I'm really glad you did that. That was good. So we did, seven, we did the 7 Eleven, but when did this yeah, yeah. whole pro life thing start? Okay, so the 7 Eleven was our first experience. And then, and, and by the way, they did take out 
all of the magazines and put them up just for a time. And then now they now they sell everything there. Um, and, and then we school board. We began to take issue with the school board. So we had real problems with our school and school board. So we ran a lady named Sue Mills, and she got on the school board. We yep. won that. You remember yeah, Sue? I do. Uh huh. I remember you lost. Yeah. And oh, they well, said more people showed up to vote against him than had ever shown up combined well, well, for any school board election. You, you have to understand, we ran three of us. We already had Sue Mills on. There were seven people on that board, and we ran three of us as a slate. All three of us from this little church, you know, which was just a little teeny church. We weren't church. even 100 people. And, and, uh, and, we, and we ran them, and, and that, that's... we. They, there were more people that voted, and that's to this day, more people that voted in that election than ever did before or ever have since to keep us out. But look America. at what happened in Virginia. You look at what happened. Now all of a sudden we're starting to get involved in school board. He's 40 years ahead of that, seeing what's happening spiritually. Okay, keep so going. We, so we're, you know, we're, we're beginning to see that this gospel is something that we've got to take outside, outside of the church, outside of the schools, and just go for it. And, and that's what we did. Now, what happened was that media would begin to come to us rather than to the mega churches. And so we'd have satellite trucks at our house Tons of times they'd come out. The neighbors are wondering, what yeah. in the world is going on with you people? And, and we're just a little church. But uh, and then in 19 in 1980, no, oh, in 1982, 80. I heard I got to a pastor's conference and it was a Bill Gothard basic youth conflict seminar. Uh, and they had 25,000 pastors in the big Coliseum, downtown Dallas. And he opened up the scripture to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. That is known as the kenosis passage. Kanao means to empty. And he made just a very simple question. At what point in time did God come to this earth? What point in time did he empty himself and come to this church? And you, you go and you read the emptying passage and the point in time when God left heaven and came to this earth in the person of Jesus was when the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. All of God was there. Well, instantly that opened up the womb for me. It opened up my eyes and I said, well, that's a living human being. Yes. That's a, that's a child. Now, I, I wish somebody in seminary had told me that, but I heard it from Bill Gothard, and it radically transformed me. I, I saw things that I had never seen before. It was always true. It was always there that a child is a child. All of the chromosomal pairs are there at conception, all 24 of them, and how tall he or she is going to be is already determined the color of his or her eyes, the kind of personality that little baby girl or baby boy has. That's already determined. Determined, and somebody has got to give her, give that mom a choice. And I knew that God was pro-choice. I had that in my mind before pro-choice became, well, pro-choice was a thing back then, but I realized that God was pro-choice. Do you know that God is pro-choice? Do you say that God is pro-choice? Probably not, because maybe you haven't heard this, but I just want you to hear it. And it's in Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20, these words. It says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day. What's today? The 29th of 29. June in the year of our Lord, 2022. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Now... Choose life so that you and your children may live. So that you and your children may live. Choose life so that you, because the Lord is your life. There isn't any life apart from Jesus. When you have this truth in your heart, you'll find out that God can make a coward equipped like myself. I was the biggest coward and still am the biggest coward I know. And when I look at my face in the morning, I'm the biggest hypocrite I'm going to see all day is right there staring back at me. I know that if God's grace isn't operating in me, there's just going to be it's going to be bad, and sometimes it does get bad. You can ask him. No, don't ask him. Please don't. And so now you've got this passage. It's oh, your eyes are open. My eyes are open, and so I'm gone. And we we uh, began to work with uh, what was the name of Ken Freeman's? 
I don't, I, I don't remember the name of it, but at any rate, we got involved with setting up shepherding homes for moms and just doing things that we thought we could do. Never thought about going to an abortion mill. Then in 1988, I, uh, I saw in Atlanta, Georgia, these people, and they were lying down in front of abortion mill doors. I'd never seen anything like that before. This was new. And by the way, that was also the time in 1988 when uh, the Democratic National Convention was also in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm, I'm seeing these people, but I'm noticing none of the press wants to watch what's going on in National Convention because you know who was running for president at the time and who was going to be elected to the Democratic Mondale? Party? Michael Dukakis. Dukakis. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. So nobody cares about the Democratic National Convention, but the media is pouring over these people on the streets, and these people are praising and worshiping God. They're praying. They're, they're beautiful. Their tears running down their face. I see this little 80 some odd year old mom of a Baptist, you know, in, in a Baptist church as a Baptist Sunday school teacher being thrown onto a paddy wagon. I'd never seen it. And they're just throwing these people on paddy wagons. And the people are just, and I'm wondering what's going on there. And I realize this is an abortion mill that they're at. That's what's going on. Randall Terry leads this thing. It's incredible. My, and my eyes were wide open, but I did not join them. I drove all the way to Atlanta, saw them. I visited Joe Foreman in jail. That's where he gave me the... The, the, the Martin Niemöller quote. No, not the Martin. But he, the book, Shattering the Darkness, it was before it became, he published it. But it was, it was a fantastic book. And I'll tell you, I, I left that place. And, and as soon as I got out of the beltway of Atlanta, starting to drive down to Dallas, which was 700 miles to the west, I began to realize that I had grieved the Holy Spirit. I just was crushed at the fact that I, I hadn't joined them, but I didn't want to drag them into my mess. You know, I didn't want to go get thrown in jail because I'd spent time in jail before I met Jesus. And I didn't want to drag his name into the same mud again. You know, here I am a pastor and I, I, don't, I, I can't do that. And, uh, and so I spent a lot more time now on this side of the cross knowing Jesus than I did back there when I was doing things in jail. It got thrown in jail for doing things I shouldn't have done. But, and God convicted me. So I said, Lord, when I got home to Dave and Jace, the kids, uh, and, and Faye, I just said, I, I will do whatever you say. And, and that was a point for me. That was a point. I'll do whatever you say. The day afterwards, I get a letter from this little Catholic kid I can't remember his name. And he says, listen, we're all getting together and we're going to do a rescue just like they did in Atlanta. Would you, would you come and join with us? I think they sent it to all the pastors they could around the Dallas area. And I, I was gone. I said, okay, I'm gone. I'm going to do it. And I did. And, uh, and, and then, so, the, uh, so um, on that first rescue that we did at Fairmont Street, you know where that is, mm -hmm. we, we had probably 50 of our church members and probably 1,000 people out in the streets, and 60 of us got arrested. 14 of them were from our church. So you have to understand, the Free Methodist Church, you don't go to jail, you don't drink, you don't do any of that stuff. You don't wear rings and you wear dresses down to your, you know, your ankles, and, and they're having a real hard time now. Can they, I stop real quick yeah. and just simply say, 14 of the members of the church, I remember them going to jail. And we'd see dad get thrown in the paddy wagon and Jason and I were okay with that. But then all of a sudden it's like, wait, that's our, that's our youth pastor. You know, I mean, we'd start, it, it was really, it was awesome. But I do want to say this. In 89, the abortion movement was just skyrocketing up. And by 91, there were over 2,000 freestanding abortion facilities. I mean, and it was, they were literally brutalizing pro-life people, beating them up, breaking arms. I watched it with my own eyes. So we're seeing this, but at the same time that the, the darkness is raging against the light is when all of a sudden now dad, but dad like raising his hand, here am I, send me from 91 to Today, there's less than 500 freestanding abortion clinics and Roe v. Wade's been overturned. And not one piece of legislation, not one piece of federal legislation had been enacted to change this. It's what, what's happening in the streets. And of course, thank God for the politicians and all that that started getting in. But this is a pivotal point 
in the story here is to see what was happening nationally with abortion. It was skyrocketing at this point. Well, All was, right, now you, you, you rescue was. 14 people in our 14 church. 14 people, arrested. and so we get it done, and I thought, good, <laughs> that's over. And, uh, you know, we spent our time, we did our thing, and, and, and then the people are calling me up saying, hey, look, they're still killing children down there in Fairmont Street. We're going, oh, no, you know what this means, right? This means we got to go back. We're going to do the same thing again and again and again and again and again, and that's exactly what happened. Lisa, you know. Your mom and dad were what the, right. some of the leaders out here, right here in Charlotte, standing in the gap, getting arrested, going to jail. I mean, it was happening all over the country. So on October 27th, there was a national day uh, of rescue. October 27th, uh, 1988. 88. 88. 88, I'm right. I think it, I was 88. So there are cities all over the country that were great rescue. It's going to be awesome. And, and we went to jail. And I'll tell you what, at that time, God was opening up the heavens. Because I want you to know something, Dave. It was God. It was our repentance before those abortion bills. That was, uh, and actually living it out, going in and standing in the gap that freed God. We had to loose on earth to free God to go to work. And, and that's what was happening in that movement. And believe me, there were people, thousands, hundreds of thousands that were, you know, that were gathering with us. The money was coming in. I don't know what happened to all that money, but I do. And by the way, money is not always a good thing. You, you just need to learn that in ministry. You going after money is not always a good thing. As a matter of fact, it just, it ruins a lot of things that God wanted to do. And when God shuts a window on a ministry, it'll stay shut. Yeah. Um, and, and he's shutting the window on several of them. But the fact of the matter is that when we went out, we were able, God would hear our prayer then because it was repentance. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He's talking about his people. You, you got to know that you're wicked. You got to know that you're the ones that are holding me up. I could do so much if you would just give me an opportunity to get on your knees and and repent before God and live out the theology. Just live it out for me. And when you do that, God opens up the heavens. So you loose it from the earth and he now can hear the prayer. If my people were called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. We're all, a lot of us in the pro-life movement are offering up a whole lot of prayers and we're pleading the cause of the children for... To plead it. To plead it, to, you know, no, money. that's right. We got to throw Jesus' name in there because that's important, and and to, to raise funds, mm -hmm. and you just you lose all vision and mission, and you become a sodality. You become Franken Church, or you know. You've heard us say that before. Well, I wonder where you got that. Right. Franken Church is just you you build this monster and then all of a sudden the monster takes over you and you're busy marketing you're busy pu pushing all this stuff trying to keep people in the seats you've got a bunch of people that you've got to pay for now you've got to take care they're on the payroll and that and that kills a ministry because a ministry the modality of a ministry is the is the the, the, the thought of suffering and vision and mission that I am doing this and God, you're going to have to bring the healing because I don't have the strategies. I don't have the things that you do. And God hears our prayer when we're that way, when we repent of what we are. And, and then he hears from heaven. He forgives our sin. He is so gracious. We have the most wonderful God because he's the only God there is. And he is absolutely amazing. And he loves each and every one of you. And he loves us. He even loves David and Jason, <laughs> which is difficult. Well, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so, so now you, this is what's happening. God is moving. It's 89. Yep. It's October. Massive. It's huge. Movement. We get up. So we, we keep doing it. Right, Lisa? We just keep going out and doing it. But you're that's, a pastor at the time. You're, well, that's, you're leading yeah, the church. They're, they're not We're happy. back the home. Free, free Methodist Church isn't happy. But, you know, I understand them. It, you know, I said, we sent you here to build a church. Are you a gospel preaching church or are you a pro-life church? And I said, you can't divide those two. That's what I, I am. And, and our church is, is thriving. It's a great church. We've got and all, all, all the people are honest with me, but they left me without appointment and said, OK, we can't have you anymore. Now, in the Free Methodist Church, if you leave a pastor without appointment, he's brain dead. 
I mean, because they need pastors. But they left me without appointment so that I wouldn't be able to, you know, um, go out to another church or assign me to another church. They just wanted me gone. And I understand that because they, they, they want you to build churches and start churches. I was a church planter, and that's what they wanted for me. So when I got all, you know, through all of that, they removed me, left me without appointment, and I'm wondering, how am I going to support, what are we going to do? And, uh, and I became the director of uh, Operation Rescue Dallas, and then in 1994, I became the director of Operation Rescue, period, the whole national thing. So and let I, me pause. That's a big jump. Because <clears throat> dad was just this little baby church in the midst of a massive 100,000 million plus people ministry. But that ministry realized very quickly that what Flip Benham was saying, that it's a gospel issue, it is fought according to the gospel, it is fought by family, we need to actually minister to these mothers. Um, and I wrote a quote here, and I can't, it, um, honoring God is more important than saving babies. That's what dad would say. Honoring God is more important than saving babies. And one of the first moves that dad made is that all the leaders, they brought him in because they realized spiritually, he's going the right direction. If this movement is going to get legs, if we are actually going to win this battle for the unborn, we have to do it God's way. And dad had articulated that theology. I mean, he was a drunk 10 years before, 15 years before. And now he's got the right theology because he didn't have any of this stuff. It was just straight up Bible reading. He did a couple of things. One of the first things he did, he told, if you're going to be a leader with me, you're not drinking alcohol. And that created a nightmare. And then he said, number two, you're going to be reading through the Bible every single year. And that creates problems. So that's why people ask me and Jason, do y'all drink? We're like, nope. We're like, what do y'all do? Well, you know, we don't drink and we try to read through the Bible every year. That's basically, basically it. But that's where we got it from. Anyway, so now in 94, now it's Operation Save America. We, well, so no, we're Operation Rescue. Rescue. And, uh, and, and so we begin just taking the gospel out in the streets. It's amazing. But now all over the country. So I've been to so many abortion mills and seen what God has done and seen so many of the saints that are the ones that really allowed this decision to get overturned. Listen. This was inconceivable to me that Roe v. Wade would be overturned. It was absolutely inconceivable, but you know what? It was inevitable that it was going to be overturned That's because awesome. I know God. I know the God of this Bible, and he's not going to sit back and be silent. And so he gets a jawbone of a donkey, makes him the president of the United States of America, and he gets three exactly. Supreme Court justices on there. This is God's hand at work. I don't care all about my brothers and sisters that hate Donald Trump because he's so so bad and so crass. Mean tweets. But, mean tweets. <laughs> yeah, man. That dude got three justices. He's a father. <laughs> He's acting like a father, not a doggone pro-life activist. He's acting like a father. I'm going to speak. And I'm, and listen, when Hillary Clinton, he said, I can remember him saying in their last debate, she had her white little pantsuit on with a with a haze, a halo kind of thing over her. I don't know how they did She was did going that. for it. They know but, how and, to And he said, it. it may be all right with... with with her, that they're going to rip little babies out of the womb, but it isn't all right with me. That's Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is the only guy I know that would have the chutzpah to stand behind those justices and 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 not bend a knee to them. He stood with Brett Kavanaugh when they were accusing him of everything that you could possibly, Amy Comey Barrett, Neil Gorsuch. He didn't budge. He knew what he was going to do. He's acting like a father. That's what we need. That is the gospel lived out in the jawbone of a donkey. But God can use jawbones of a donkey. He does it with regularity every Sunday morning in pulpits across this nation. He can use the jawbone of a donkey if we're just willing the weak and foolish things to confound the wise. And the weak and foolish things that we're establishing all of this are out in the streets today, at the abortion mills today. They're out there. They're standing there. They, some of them feel, you know, I, and they're getting all, called all sorts of names, everything else, but they are stay there. And, and this is what we see when people are truly humble themselves and pray and seek his face, turn from their wicked ways, and they show up. Then God is able and free to do what he's done. Roe versus Wade is overturned today because of the great politicians and great political theories. Oh, most of our pro-life politicians are working on stupid little regulatory laws. 24-hour waiting period, parental consent, uh, partial birth abortion ban. These things 
are, you know, are done with good intentions, but they are not the answer. The answer is the God in heaven whom we have offended as a nation. And now God is allowing this whole thing to be overturned. And that's exactly what happened with Norma McCorvey. She gave 95. her heart to Christ. She did it. And I mean, it was an amazing thing because when they, when they called me up and told me I was in Minnesota, they told me, listen, we, we, we've got a place. A guy wants to give us a place right next to the abortion mill, a choice for women. And, uh, and, and would you like to go there? And I said, no, I don't really want to go there. I'd rather be somewhere else for but our put national your office. office. Yeah, put your office there. Put our office there. And so, and so, and so, but he said, it's a, a, a dollar a month. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, okay, okay, we could possibly do that. And so we moved in right next to the abortion well, and I did not know that Norma McCorvey was there. I had no idea, but God did. And what began in Dallas, God was driving full circle into Washington, D.C., where we have January 22nd, that awful law, Roe versus Wade, all the way back to Dallas, Texas, so that he could pick up a little girl who, whose name is uh, Norma McCorvey, a.k.a. Jane Rowe, and he said, and I'm going to save that little girl, and I'm going to set her up, and she's going to become a voice for little baby boys and girls. This is the amazing God that I know, and, and these things happen not because of great articulation and strategic thought. I have not one of those. I can remember the pro aborts always saying, hey, these people have got this strategy. They've got a lot of money coming in. We don't have any money coming in at all. We're all volunteers. Nobody's got a penny, you know, and, and, we're, and we're just able to do things because God himself, we were cooking on the oil of the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, you find out you don't need conservatism because it is pretend salt. And that's not something that I penned. That's R.L. Dabney did that. And he was a general in the, in the Confederate Army. And uh, he's, he warned about watch out for conservatism because it looks right. It talks right. It'll sing the same songs you do, pray the prayers that you do. But it's not the real deal. It's not real salt. Let me tell you what happened was not political orchestration this past Friday that they came out with that decision. That was God himself doing that. I don't need a government to fix it when I've got Almighty God who, if I'll just allow him, will show up and show off in a way that will amaze the whole world. Amen. And that's what happened with Norman McCorvey. And believe me, that sent shudders across and around the world, across this nation and around the world. God is big yeah. and strong, and he saved a wretch like me, and that's how I know the truth. So then J she gets saved. I remember Connie gets saved, her lesbian partner. I remember we, you, we rented a U-Haul trailer and moved Connie out of Norma's house. Yeah. That was politically incorrect. But it was awesome just watching all this. Now in 97, you confronted Dr. Haskell. Tell them about the time that you confronted George Tiller's priest. Um, now, George Tiller is Tiller the Killer. He was a guy that had, was doing abortions in Wichita? Yeah. Was it Wichita, yeah. Kansas? And I mean like an incinerator. And this was a guy that was... He baptized those babies that exactly, were killed, that Tiller killed. He got this priest, this George Tiller he's got this a, priest, to, or what, he was wearing a, a collar a pastor, when you debated he, him. He, listen, that was Whatever, that he's a wolf in shepherd's clothing. It's a representative so I of I watched dad theology. literally walk this man down. Like I remember, we, we, we always say in this battle, there are the enslaved and the enslavers. The enslaved are the 99 percent. It's the mother. It's the it's it's the people that are enslaved by this. But then there's the enslaver. And that's the one percent. Those are the elites. Those are the ones that have sold themselves to do the works of Satan. Yeah. Jesus spoke differently to those. Paul spoke differently to those two groups of people. And so now it's like mean tweets, be nice, be so relevant that you're a freaking doormat. Sorry, I said freaking. Yeah, Lori's back that. there. She's mad don't at me do again. That. But, but you're a to doormat, me. right? You're a doormat. And God does not want us to be a doormat when a wolf is about to bust through your door. Amen. He wants you to stand up. And so I watched dad. It was on the news. They had that some, I'll never forget the commentator was sitting here at a table. Dad was here and this preacher. George this, Gardner. George Gardner, this preacher was here. And this preacher was talking about United my Church. truth. Like all the stuff that we're seeing today, my truth. And I remember dad said, you need to turn that collar around. It's backward. I mean, he's like leaning in, talking. And I'll just never forget the commentator's like, just looking like what, what's about to happen here. 
And, Tell and, and I just said, you call yourself a Christian. You are no more a Christian than you are a poached egg, my friend. You are not a Christian. So stop saying that and telling me I got to be a lot nicer about the way I'm saying things because I am nice because the kindest thing I can do is tell you the truth and the truth really obliterates you. Yeah, this guy was baptizing the babies. He would come in like on the weekends and baptize baptized the dead babies. Dead babies. And parents would get their pictures taken around the dead baby. I'm telling you, this happens. It, if you knew what's going on in the abortion mills, the three of them down here in the city of Charlotte, you would do more than you're doing. Then you were in Houston and it was the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and Sister Boom Boom and all this stuff that you dealt with publicly and end up getting thrown in jail. Walk us through that. That was a breaking in a junction. I was across the street from Fannin Street. It was a, it was a Republican National Convention that was held there. And we were we passed out the conservatism is pretend salt brochure there. That's the first time we passed that brochure out. It was really good. And uh, and uh, so uh, we <laughs> at the Republican <laughs> Convention, of course, don't go to the DNC, go to the RNC and yeah. stir it up. Amen. So 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 we were we were told that we we could not pray on a sidewalk across the street from the Planned Parenthood abortion mill in Houston. So, of course, and Judge Eileen O'Neill issued an injunction and said, you will not do that. And so we went across the street on that sidewalk that she said we couldn't pray on, and we took her injunction and ripped it up and, you know, threw it down and said, we're going to pray right here. And that's what we did. Can, we, can, can I just pause for a second? Yeah. Is that Christ-like? Ask yourself, is that Christ? No, no, let's just go to today's theology. Is that Christ-like according to today's theology? No. What would be Christ-like would be to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to abide by it. I would like to have a cup of coffee with you over the next 36 months. And, and only, never tell you the truth. Only do as much good. And only, I'll only speak as much good as evil will allow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's what he did. He burned it up. No, it didn't burn it. You, we burned all those other Supreme no, Court decisions. Yeah, we, we did that. We but did you that ripped it up. Yep, yeah, ripped it up. And went and stood across the street. Stood across the street. And so the d next day, as we we're all gathered together, ready to go back out, they had uh, all of the United States Marshals and everybody come in and they arrested, uh, I think there were 16 of us that they arrested. <laughs> and I was one of them. And uh, it was, you know, but that's just what happens when you're going to live up. Most of the New Testament was written from jail. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise to you if you end up there. Where do the Sisters <laughs> of Perpetual Indulgence fit into that? Oh, they... <laughs> All right, now help me to understand. You remember what you're Sister at. Boom Boom? It was I know the tr her. cross dress, the transgender yeah. nuns. Yeah. And what was she pushing? Wasn't she pushing something in Houston at the time? I don't even remember. Help me. Okay, but you remember Sister Boom Boom? Oh yeah, of course. And I what do. was? What's her role? What, what is she? Or he? He was uh, well marching up and down the streets because now I understand that's a Republican National Convention, which was a boring convention. Pat Buchanan was running at that time, and uh, and so they're out in the streets. The media is covering us. I mean, we were on TV all time in the court trial that we had, and I was defending myself, which was really great to defend myself. <laughs> yeah, I was good. I got to say so many things, and uh, uh, but but uh, and they'd have big parades, and Sister Boom Boom uh, would go out there, and they and they had their nuns. What do they call those things? What? Ha habit. Habits. Yeah, they had the habit on. They, these guys had the habit on. They they did all that stuff. They were just they were just mocking God, mocking everyone. And uh, but that's what they did. And yet they allowed them the voice. They allowed them to gather where they wanted to gather, but then they threw him in jail. Now, while you were in jail, that's when you realized, okay, I've got a young family. Yeah. We were 16 at the time. I yeah. got a young family. Now, I don't have any money. The, they had fired you from the Free Methodist Church. So no salary, everything's No, they left open. me without appointment. They, they left fire me. Okay, sorry, he did not yeah, get fired. They, they, so left in other words, I was not disciplined. I, would, I remained faithful under yeah, yeah. them and on purpose for, uh, until 2002. So they, I, they let me go in 1992. So that was 10 years I remained an elder in that church. And every time, every me and media would come up to me all the time. Uh, it wasn't like it is today. I mean, so you had certain, and, and I would, they, they would come up and ask me and I would always tell them I am a member 
in good standing of the Free Methodist Church. <laughs> <laughs> they hated that. Oh my gosh. Jason and I would literally wear like shirts of different businesses and gyms when we would go on different news channels to talk about abortion or something like that. And I remember getting a call from a buddy. He's like, dude, you always wear the shirt for my company when you're on talking about this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm trying to pull you into the fight. So anyway, but but it was at that time that you uh, were like, God, how am I going to how am I going to yeah, pay how am for I gonna things? Do that? How am I going to pay? I, I, I had no way. And and um, I, I was going to this uh, little church and this was probably three weeks after I was in jail. And um, and the pastor called me in. I'm going, oh, what did I do? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just thinking I must have done something stupid. Uh, and he called me in and he said, listen, I, I just got this check here. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's to you. And I just wanted to give it to you. And it was a check for $28,000. Uh, $28, it was just something like that. And it was, it was a check like for... Every day that I was in jail, that was a thousand dollars a day, and and then it broken down to the hours. That's where he got the two hundred and twenty, uh, twenty eight thousand. And I'm wondering how is this? Because God provides. God provides, and that didn't only happen once. That happened a number of times without him ever asking. By the way, he never no, went. We never, never would ask for money ever. No, we, we never did because we didn't have to because there is a God in heaven that will provide for you. How many of you believe that? No, really, if you believe it, raise your hand really high. Well, then really believe it because you're going to have to be reminded over and over again because God sometimes gets you in situations where you're flat out of money. And, uh, and if you, but if you're going in the right direction, God has ways and he, he has ways and jobs and things like that. And also, children are your wealth. I know this. Children are your wealth. I get to do stuff that most people don't get to do. I don't have to work for one doggone thing. I can be out at that abortion mill six days a week, which I am. Sometimes, uh, you know, for a long time, sometimes for a short time, but I'm always out there. You know why? Because I can do that. I've got time. God has just provided for me. Well, how does a pastor make any money? I don't have any money, but I got some boys that are helping <laughs> It's like I had a choice. Go to jail and do this or be that business guy that's hooking them up. It's like, I think I'll go that route. <laughs> I'd rather do that. <laughs> you know, I want to wrap this up, Dad. It was, you know, there's literally, I mean, it was just too Why many Why don't you let me wrap this posts. up with a beat, with a, just one awesome. thing in a Bible. I won't wrap it up. I'll let you wrap it up. But I want to, this is the Bible reading for today that we had today. And I thought it was really important. And I'm going to read this to you. And it's from 2 Chronicles chapter, uh, chapter 15. Uh, and I'm going to read uh, six verses. And I just want you to hear, this is where we are today. So where are you? And what do you see God doing? Because I'm pretty sure you haven't heard over the media what was just said today. <laughs> hear this. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa. Asa and all Judah and Benjamin, listen to me. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. That would be us today. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. That decision on Friday, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization is directly a gift of God's grace to you and to me. Because what was happening in those days? In those days, it was not safe to travel about for all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another and one city by another because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But as for you, be strong and do not give up. Don't get, don't get tired in well-doing. Don't give up. Do not give up. 
for your work will be rewarded. Mm -hmm. Amen. The word of God for the people of God on this 29th day of June in the year of our Lord, 2022. Your work, your work will be rewarded. Amen. Pray us out, Dad. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for this opportunity to be with these special folks. I mean, wow. Everyone, a friend, and, and better yet, a friend of yours. Thank you for what you can do. Thank you, Lord, that you can take this, the weak things, the foolish things, the, the things that this world despises, and bring to naught the things that are. And you did that with the Roe v. Wade mm. decision, and turning that thing over, it was bad law, turning over Planned Parenthood versus Casey, bringing these things back to the states, that means closer to your church and that we can rise up. We see your hand at work and now we're beginning to see the real truth. This just is not, it is not the end. It's not the beginning of the end. But as Winston Churchill said, it is the end of the beginning. We're hearing from heaven. We understand now, Lord, that what we loose here on this earth, then you are free to loose from heaven and pour your forgiveness and your mercy and grace into us and to heal our land. Lord, we're asking you to heal America. Bring us back to you and help us not to fear anything that breathes in Jesus' wonderful name. And the church said, Amen.